My name is Myra Lopez. I'm with the North Central Texas Council of Governments, and I will be moderating today's uh, webinar. We will have two presentations today by Mary Gugliusa from the Fort Worth Water Department and Scott Hosel from the North uh, Texas Municipal Water District. We will have plenty of time for questions at the end of each of the presentations, so feel free to submit any questions in the chat box during the webinar. We will also be recording this webinar, which will be available on the NCT COG website along with the presentations. The website can be found at the end of the webinar. Okay, so our first speaker today is Mary Gugliusa. Mary has been with the Fort Worth Water Department for over 21 years. She oversees the department's internal and external communications. Among her responsibilities are media relations, crisis communications, public involvement, community outreach, education, and social media and web page oversight. Mary serves as the Vice Chair of the American Water Works Association Public Affairs Council and chairs its Media and Stakeholder Relations Committee. She is Chair of the Public Information Committee for the Texas Section of AWWA and a member of the Water uh, Environment Federation, Water Environment Association of Texas, and the Fort Worth Chapter of the Public Relations Society of America. In 2011, she was honored with the George Warren Fuller Award by the Texas Section of AWWA. Prior to joining the water industry, Mary's work background includes newspaper reporting, tourism marketing, and serving as a public information officer for a state mental health and mental retardation facility and a medical hospital. A native of New Orleans, Mary has a journalism degree from Southwest Texas State University in San Marcos. Okay, Mary, whenever you're ready, take it away. Hello, everyone. I'm going to um, walk you through uh, Fort Worth involvement in the um, SSOI initiative of TCEQ. Um, I'll give you an overview of our system, talk about our regulatory history, um, talk more details about our SSOI program, um, and then at the end I'll actually uh, share with you a, a graph on um, the changes we've seen in our SSOI history through the years. So let's go ahead and get started. First of all, Fort Worth has only one water treatment, uh, wastewater treatment plant. It's the Village Creek Water Reclamation Facility. It is permitted for 166 million gallons a day average treatment. Um, in fiscal year 2016, our average daily treated wastewater was actually 124, or just over 124 million gallons. Um, the city is quite sizable with over 353 square miles, and then the ETJ is almost as big as the city itself with over 300 square miles in the ETJ. We do provide wastewater service uh, to 23 wholesale customers, um, and overall, including wholesale and retail, we serve over 1.1 million people. The collection system itself has over 3,300 miles of uh, lines, pipelines. Um, they range in size from about a, uh, one and a quarter inch up to 108 inch. While most of the system is gravity flow, we do have some force mains. There are nine major basins and 167 sub basins. Um, and this number on the manholes and junction boxes is actually a couple of years old, so it's probably quite higher than that now because we are continuing to grow. To talk a little bit about our past regulatory history, um, I'm actually going to go back beyond what this slide shows. In 1989, EPA actually requested Fort Worth uh, what our plan was to address wet weather overflows in the collection system. Um, but then in 93 is when they issued the administrative order, and we were given eight years to complete that. We actually completed it in seven. Um, the program actually began, the wet, what we call the wet weather program, in 1994. Um, in 96, we began our preventative maintenance program for the collection system. Um, and in 2000, we were released a year ahead of schedule from the um, uh, administrative order by EPA. The wet weather program cost us over those seven years uh, almost $216 million. Um, and then in April of 2007, 
we entered into the um, sanitary sewer overflow initiative with TCEQ. Our agreement was for 10 years, so it actually expires at the end of this year. We have been invited by TCEQ to re-enter the program. We submitted our letter of intent to do so uh, back to TCEQ, and we have been given until January 30th of 2018 to submit our new 10-year plan um, with those goals and objectives for that 10-year program. So we have groups already working toward uh, meeting that goal and timeline. <clears throat> but we also know from um, our colleagues that um, the current environment um, is really not administrative orders, it really is um, enforcement actions, and um, we know that Houston and Corpus are already in negotiations with the Department of Justice and EPA. Fort Smith um, was uh, had was issued a, a consent decree back in 2015, Shreveport in 13, and San Antonio also in 13. And you can see some of the details uh, of those consent decrees on this slide. But we also know that regionally, EPA Region 6 is um, systematically going through the major dischargers or permit holders in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Um, they started with North Texas Municipal Water District, and I'm sure um, Scott will talk more about that later. Um, but um, they are now um, looking at the Trinity River Authority, and when they do this, they not only look at the um, utility itself, but also all the wholesale customers um, and what their systems are like. So. The way they're moving toward the west, once they get done with TRA, we're kind of expecting that Fort Worth will be next on that list. Our program um, that we've been doing in Fort Worth really does focus on maintenance, renewal, and replacement of our um, old and deteriorating lines and identifying which those are. Um, we have committed our funds for infrastructure and by entering the SSOI, we, we see it doing this rather than spending the money on penalties. We'd rather put those funds into the system itself to improve it. And ours is a team approach, approach using um, that incorporates many of the different divisions or sections within our utility, um, from engineering and field ops to the plan itself, um, and not forgetting education, um, opportunities either. You can also see pretreatment, the lab, and regulatory obviously are all part of this process. There are several major components to the program that all feed into it, or it feeds into, to be honest with you. Um, the wastewater master plan is one of those, uh, which is an overall view of the entire system, what we expect to happen with growth, but it also takes into account um, uh, condition assessments that we have in hand. Um, we have asset management for the sewer system, and I'm going to talk more about some of these things on subsequent slides. But our first responders, those are the key staff uh, groups within our uh, collection system maintenance and field operations that actually respond when we get reports of, of backups or um, uh, SSOs. Um, then there's our preventive maintenance and our ICAP, which stands for inter Interceptor Collector Assessment Program, uh, Interceptor Capacity Assessment Program. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that more later as well. Um, root eradication, as I'm sure many of you know, that's a huge issue in sewer systems. Um, and then repairs and renewals through our capital improvement plan. And of course, keeping fat oils and grease out of the system as much as we possibly can. Um, so our preventive maintenance and cleaning group um, has a goal to try and do the entire system over a 10-year cycle. Um, and each year they clean somewhere, if I look at, at the past history, between 1.5 and 1.75 million linear feet of pipelines. Um, and last year, um, we, as this graph shows you, we removed over 574 
cubic yards of debris from the system through those cleaning efforts. And if you look at it, you can see where it's, this graph also illustrates the amounts for the last five years. It averages to about 599 cubic yards a year. TV inspection is very important uh, because it helps us see what the condition of the lines are. And we also have goals to um, inspect about one and a half to uh, over 1.5 million linear feet a year. And we've been doing that up to the same as about with the um, uh, maintenance portion, about 1.75 million linear feet. So um, weather can obviously impact that, but we've been doing between 1.5 and 1.75 for the last several years. All this inspection um, data is then turned into a ranking on the condition of the pipe. Now, this is mostly being done with in-house staff and really is looking at the uh, smaller size lines uh, that are feeding the uh, homes for the most part, not the large collectors, and I'll get to that in a, in a little bit. Um, and then they, they've come up with a system to rank them from one to five, with one being the best and five being the worst, um, for potential failure of the pipe. And obviously the ones with the higher rating are the ones we want to give the most attention to, either through um, field crews who sometimes do some minor um, relay projects themselves or um, get it into the CIP for um, engineering and design. The, we do have a completely separate program called the Interceptor Condition Assessment Program. Um, we have 265 miles of large diameter sewer pipes that are 24 inches and greater. Six years ago, the department initiated this ICAP program. We use sonar, high definition TV, and 3D laser technology that's mounted on a robotic system and is pulled through the interceptors. ICAP gathers data and integrates it into analysis of pipe condition that were not previously possible. The data enables um, Fort Worth to rank the pipes according to remaining useful life on a scale of one to five. Though some of these technologies have been applied elsewhere to analyze failures after they occur, Fort Worth ICAP is the first in the U program is the first in the U.S. to actually determine pipe condition and useful life, enabling prioritized maintenance scheduling. And ICAP uh, is the largest known implementation of this technology. Um, so far, the um, the type of data rather that we're getting with ICAP is the interior pipe circumference, indicating how much corrosion has occurred. Uh, along the pipe walls. Uh, it helps us to locate leaks and detects where rainwater is infiltrating these large um, interceptors. And it also has helped us by providing improved imaging of the pipe interiors. Through year five, we had inspected 862,671 feet of our large diameter sewer pipes. Um, we only do cleaning on the ICAP program if the sonar data depicts debris is present. Um, the remaining wall thickness is determined and that helps us calculate the remaining useful life. Uh, finding issues before they collapse has saved us money, environmental problems, and potential enforcement issues. And also, this program was recognized with the TCEQ Environmental Excellence Award for Innovation Operations Management, um, I'm sorry, for Innovative Operations Management in 2016. Um, our first responders, they're the ones who go out to all backups if we get a report of an overflow inside a home or a business. Any issues concerning stops, stoppages, uh, they respond to. They also do routine degreasing and root cutting and manhole inspections. Um, and they, we actually, several years ago, 
Now it's part of the design and requirements, but before that we didn't necessarily require a clean out at the property line. So now we require that when new construction or new subdivisions go in, we have clean outs at the property line. So we have access, um, easy access to see what's happening when customers call about uh, uh, backups. And if they're not there on older areas of town, we actually install them when we get called out to a problem at a location. Um, we do have a standard operating procedure for dealing with SSOs. I, we would be very glad to share that with anyone who's interested in seeing the document. Um, this slide just highlights for you the major sections of that policy, and it covers pretty much everything including um, severe rain event reporting. Um, we want to make sure we're in compliance with the TCEQ rules um, for when public notification is required um, on, on severe rain events. It's always a challenge, it has been, how to determine um, the amount of an SSO. Our folks for numerous, for many years now have used this chart that they found uh, developed by a utility out in California who actually um, did the measurements um, to create the overflows to, to actually measure the volume. And our guys carry this with them in their trucks. Um, so when they're responding to an SSO, they actually know um, or have a better idea by looking at it and then looking at this chart to be able to compare um, what we think the gallons per minute is so we can report that to TCEQ. We also, in our collection system, have um, some monitoring equipment that we use to help us in maintaining um, or being aware of what's going on in the system. Um, we have 14 smart covers, and smart covers provide two-way wireless communications um, and real-time continuous remote sensing, user-definable alarm settings, and a web-based interface. The smart covers provide us a way to immediately uh, have staff alerted when an SSO occurs, and they also provide a predictive function. We're able to use the um, data collection and analysis uh, information so staff can identify emerging problems that could lead to SSOs, and then this helps us address those problems before a spill can occur. But in addition to this, when it comes to SSOs, um, as I talked about earlier, um, the condition of the pipe is critical. Um, knowing what that is and, and so we can prevent collapses and such. And because of the factors that hydrogen sulfide can eat away, or the way hydrogen sulfide can eat away at concrete, we have nine ODA loggers um, in our system. It's, uh, so these log the amount of hydrogen sulfide gas. Um, the logger uses a built-in, and this is going to get a little technical, but there might be those of you on the phone who are, I'm sorry, on the webinar who are interested in knowing this. So it uses a built-in GSM modem to transmit logged hydrogen sulfide data to an FTP site for remote access. This allows for remote monitoring of the data from collection lines and treatment plants. It is designed specifically for harsh sewer environments. Um, using an external surface mount antenna, the data can be transmitted out of cast iron manholes. SMS text messages can be sent when user programmable alarms are met. The wireless transmission of the hydrogen sulfide gas concentration data is sent via a GPRS SIM card to the internet. And we have the flexibility to see the data either in a graph or a tabular format. So that's really up to the staff member analyzing it which way they prefer and which uh, to see it in order to interpret what it's telling them. Another 
very important part of our program that we've only been doing for about the last three years is we investigate every SSO, every stoppage or backup that's reported. Um, we look upstream, we look downstream, we try to figure out why this happened so we can prevent it from happening again. Um, there have been some cases where we've traced the problem back to, say, a um, commercial enterprise in the area, um, in which case we will bring in our pretreatment staff um, to assist us in um, working with that business to make sure the problem does not reoccur or that they have the proper measures um, on site at their place uh, if, if that's necessary. Um, I think everybody can agree grease is a big problem. Um, and apartments and grease from apartments is a really big challenge for us. Um, we are trying to um, uh, figure out how we can tackle this. Apartments are not like restaurants. They're not plumbed separately to have a grease trap. Um, the tenants there, because they don't have ownership, uh, maybe um, don't take the responsibility of keeping the pipes clear like we would hope. Um, so we've actually decided, uh, we're going to be setting up some discussions with some other parts of the city, some other departments who have interaction with apartments. Um, for instance, we believe uh, in the last year, maybe two, started a recycling program um, with apartments. So we'd like to bring the folks involved in that in. Um, maybe some of the code compliance folks who have interaction because apartments in Fort Worth are required to be registered and inspected and um, get the folks that deal with apartments in that way and see what we can do to, to help educate the management at apartments and get the word out to the tenants um, at apartments um, to, to help us make a dent in this problem because according to our field staff, uh, Grease from apartments is a really big issue for us still. But all of this information is taken from um, the field, and when the projects are too big for the field crews to handle themselves, it gets rolled up to our engineering group and becomes part of the capital plan. Um, our current capital plan has about $169 million in projects. About $52 million of that $169 million is devoted to construction of large diameter wastewater collector mains. Um, there's about five different basins that we're looking at. I'm going to talk a little bit about one to give you an idea of some of the things we're doing in, the, in this area. Um, <coughs> excuse me. But, um, this does not include that 52 million is only the large uh, diameter wastewater collectors. There's other money in the CIP for um, rehab of smaller lines. This, this, again, only addresses the 52 million, specifically the large diameter lines. This shows you a few of the projects currently in the works and the cost associated with those. Um, Upper Big Fossil, Eagle Mountain to Big Fossil, um, the sludge storage facility at Village Creek, um, and which isn't directly related, I guess that's more biosolids, but then the 96-inch um, uh, West Fork sewer line rehab. So one of the basins where we know we have some issues is our Village Creek Basin. Um, it actually starts well south of the city. Um, Crowley and Burleson are two of the wholesale customers um, in this basin. And um, this map kind of de defines the basin for you. And um, so you can see where those overflows are. Um, there are several that are very close to Lake Arlington and can get into Lake Arlington. 
there's two or three right there nearby it. And then there's some others that we're seeing downstream of the Burleson meter station. The, um, we break this basin down into three areas, actually, uh, lower, middle, and upper. Um, the lower basin, the part to the top, um, was initially a 39-inch to a 48-inch line that went in in 1957, um, concurrent with the construction of the Village Creek plant. Um, a 60-inch to 72-inch relief sewer line was built in 2006 to parallel um, the existing pipeline and provide additional capacity. Because of that, at the moment, we don't have any projects in that lower portion of the basin planned in the near future. The next portion would be the Middle Creek, the middle portion. Um, initially, it was a 36-inch sewer line that was constructed from 1957 to 1965. A 54-inch relief sewer was constructed in the 80s and 90s to parallel the existing 36 and provide more capacity, but we're still experiencing SSOs. Um, and the final portion is the upper Village Creek system, which basically goes from Everman down south to Burleson and Crowley. The Texas Water Quality Board, a predecessor, I believe, to TCEQ, required Burleson and Crowley to uh, close their wastewater plants and connect to the Fort Worth system back in 1971. The sewer lines were extended from the existing Fort Worth sewer lines located downstream of Everman to the Burleson and Crowley city limits. When we look at today, um, this map is basically the, the, the pink or purplish area um, on the map is a new development where Tarleton State University will be uh, putting a campus in part of that over near the Chisholm Trail Parkway. Um, in order to accommodate the flow uh, that's going to be generated by that new development, um, we're going to be doing a series of work on these lines. Uh, the plans to construct, construct a new main parallel uh, through the existing one in Crowley, then upstream of uh, that new line, Fort Worth, will cost participate. So over there, we're going to cost participate with developers um, to oversize the lines that they're putting in um, in, the tar in that RLO, uh, Rock GLO, which is the area where Tarleton's going to be and then some other developers in that area. Um, to, we want to upsize the lines they're putting in more cost effective for us. Once these projects are done, um, we'll be able to actually decommission two existing lift stations in the far part of South Worth, or far part of South Fort Worth. Um, we are also going to be um, increasing the lines that we have that run through Crowley and from Burleson. And Burleson and Crowley respectively will be um, cost participating in that portion of the lines that affect them because they're seeing development. So they have a need, uh, they're going to be sending us more flow. So again, the need for more capacity in the system in addition to our own development. I should point out the, um, Tarleton, for instance, that development over there is actually going to flow through these lines that come through Crowley. The um, downstream segments of this are out for bid for construction at this time, and the upstream portions um, through Crowley and Burleson are um, in design, I believe. The middle portion of this basin, um, we're seeing um, it's from Everman up along the west side of Lake Arlington to um, Lancaster. And we've accepted RFPs for the design of the proposed improvements to this section uh, that include a lift station and a force main. Um, it's my understanding the consultant's been selected and we're negotiating an agreement now. Uh, while a portion of the work along East Lancaster is being funded with the um, State Revolving Loan Fund, the other portion is eligible for impact fee funding because it is uh, growth related. 
So really the issues in this basin are both um, rehab, the need to replace or improve aging lines, but also the needs to uh, increase capacity because of growth. And this just tells you we're looking at spending about $82 million for improvements um, in this basin. Now, keeping all this flow inside the pipes means it's all going to get to the wastewater plant and how is the plant going to be able to deal with that. So we actually um, have constructed a peak flow basin on our property uh, on the north side of the river from the plant. And um, actually I believe we're going to be testing the basin this week. Um, so construction is almost complete on um, that project. Um, this project was kind of interesting. We had to actually, it's, it's a little hard to see, but down here in this part is actually a river crossing. So coffer dams had to go up to hold back the river on both sides. Um, it was actually pretty challenging for the contractor and took uh, about six to eight weeks to actually get across the river. I can't tell you how many times they had to put up and take down those coffer downs because of the rainfall we were getting. And the, um, there's some pretty incredible time-lapse photography of watching the river rise and go back down um, because of the rains that were happening last fall when this was trying to be done across the river. They also had extensive, put in an extensive groundwater remediation system because um, that presented a challenge for them and that white piping you see um, is actually part of that uh, groundwater remediation in trying to cross the river. We don't want to forget that um, outreach is an important aspect of what we do. Um, again, as I talked about apartments and working with those tenants, outreach is going to be critical as we try to reach those folks and get them to help us with solving those grease issues. Um, we do partner with COG uh, on their FOG initiative and have done bill inserts in our bills the last few years to um, help get the message out about the roundup that they do. I know for us, uh, our grease issues do rise with the holidays. Uh, and I'm sure that's probably true for most of you. Um, but we need numerous things to try and get the messages out, not just to apartments, but to all of our customers. This is just another example of a bill insert. And actually this insert will go out in bills that start next week and run for the next month. Um, try and get folks to keep their grease out of the system. Um, we also comply with the public notification requirements from TCEQ uh, on spills and accidental discharges and issue the news releases to the media um, as required. This rule has been in effect getting up close to 20 years now, I guess 18, and um, they did make some revisions to the rule about six years ago. And finally, all of this has, as a result of all of this work by a lot of folks for many years, we can say we have seen a steady decline um, and significant uh, in the number of SSOs we're seeing per 100 miles of pipe. Um, the FY17 number is not a final number because we still have two months worth of data left to put in that. Um, so that 4.2, as you can see, is the lowest we've ever been in the last 20 years. Um, it is within our goal of three to four and a half SSOs per 100 miles, so it's the first time we've actually achieved that goal. Um, unless something major happens in August and September's data, um, hopefully we'll be able to meet our goal this year, but um, we're pretty pleased with the progress that we've made in reducing those sanitary sewer overflows because you could see back in 1998 when we were in the throes of the wet weather program, we were seeing over 75 uh, overflows per 100 miles of pipe, so almost one per mile, not quite, but uh, getting up there. So. Um, we've seen pretty good results with our approach to reducing SSOs. 
And that is all I have. Thank you all. Thank you, Mary. So up next is uh, Scott Hosel. Scott has served the water and wastewater sector for nearly 20 years as both a consulting engineer and an operations manager for a public utility. He is currently employed by the North Texas Municipal Water District where he serves as the manager of the wastewater conveyance system. The system provides service to approximately 1 million people located in north and east of Dallas and includes 23 lift stations, over 200 miles of lar large diameter pipelines, and 40 remote meter stations. All right, Scott, whenever you're ready, take it away. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'm excited to be able to tell our story today uh, about regional collaboration and CMOM in North Texas. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about our EPA inspections that uh, were conducted by EPA for North Texas as well as our member cities, our collaborative response to those inspections, and the development of our CMOM plans. So North Texas Municipal Water District is a regional provider for water, wastewater, and solid waste services. Our vision is to provide regional service through unity, meeting our region's needs today and tomorrow. So we serve approximately 90 communities in the areas northeast of the DFW Metroplex. Um, in all, uh, we serve over one and a half million people with about one million on the wastewater side. Uh, we've got six water treatment plants that have a capacity of over 800 million gallons per day with 566 miles of water transmission pipelines. On the wastewater system, we've got over 250 miles of large diameter pipelines. So that's mostly pipelines that are 24 inches and larger. We've got uh, 14 different wastewater treatment plants with a combined capacity of over 150 million gallons per day. On the solid waste side, we have three transfer stations uh, that take uh, waste to the 121 Regional Disposal Facility uh, that's located in Melissa. So our wastewater system is divided into three groups. We've got two of the groups which are uh, defined by treatment plants. There's the regional wastewater system, then we have a sewer system, the treatment plants there, and then we have the conveyance system. So the regional wastewater system uh, is comprised of four plants uh, with a total capacity of 118 million gallons per day. And then the sewer system has got uh, 10 plants with a combined capacity of 34 million gallons per day. So as you can see, the total treatment capacity of the system is, is uh, just a little bit over 150 million gallons per day. And then on there on the right side of the screen, you can see our general location of our service area, which is mostly concentrated in in Collin County. Now the wastewater conveyance system, which is the system that, that I manage, is really comprised of four separate systems. So the, the largest system by far is the Upper East Fork Interceptor System, uh, which is in the, the northwestern portion of our service area, and it includes uh, areas in Allen, Frisco, McKinney, Plano, uh, Prosper, uh, Richardson, and then the, and there's a smaller system that's there, System B, is the Muddy Creek Wastewater Treatment Plant System. It serves Murphy and Wiley, which is uh, the city where our North Texas offices are located, and our uh, water treatment plant. And we have the South Mesquite Regional Conveyance System, and that's the second largest system that we have. It includes uh, service for Forney, Heath, Mesquite, Rockwall, and Seagoville. And then on the far eastern side of our system, we have the Sabine Creek uh, Wastewater Treatment Plant System, which serves the communities of Fate and Royce City. So the reliability of our region's wastewater system is critical for safeguarding public health, protecting the environment, and promoting economic development. 
Unfortunately, many parts of the country, including our region, experience sanitary sewer overflows. And those can be caused by many things, uh, aging infrastructure, grease clogs. Uh, we've also had lots of problems more recently with uh, rag problems, um, inadequate capacity, uh, poor construction, power outages. So there's all these causes to sanitary sewer overflows. And that's where CMOM and the SSOI program come in. These are set up to try to address these causes of sanitary sewer overflows. Now, North Texas participates in, in both of these programs. Uh, the SSOI program, uh, which is administered by TCEQ, and the CMOM program, which uh, is promoted by the Environmental Protection Agency. So the SSOI program, as you can see on the left, uh, includes a lot of the same activities that are in the CMOM program. Um, this on the left kind of roughly includes a lot of the items that are included on the, uh, the SSOI reporting worksheet that's provided by TCEQ. And then the CMOM program, which is on the right, uh, the CMOM stands for Capacity Management Operations and Maintenance. And you can see all the components for each of those programs and how they really touch every component of your uh, operation and maintenance of your collection system. Next we have a map that's on the EPA website. And this map shows the sewer systems across the United States that have a greater uh, than 10 million gallons per day capacity. And this is an interactive map, so if you're interested, you can go online uh, under EPA National Enforcement Initiative and look under Sanitary Sewer Overflows, and you can find this map and click on the dot if it represents uh, your community or somebody else's community and see the details that EPA has associated with your system. Uh, this is another graph that was pulled from the EPA website, and it I guess the main things to take off of this graph are, in all, there's 1,103 systems that have over the 10 million gallons per day. And this, this graph shows the cumulative progress towards addressing those systems. So you can see the FY 2016 to the goal end date, uh, 964 uh, systems have been addressed and 63 systems have uh, EPA has initiated enforcement actions against. That's a total of 1,027 uh, entities, and so they're just short of reaching their goal to try to address all 1,100 systems. So EPA uh, came and did some inspections of North Texas Municipal Water District, as well as our 12 member cities in 2014 in 2015. So this table here provides a little background on North Texas. On the far left are our regional wastewater system members, and those are the communities that were focused on uh, by EPA in their inspections. Uh, we have uh, regional wastewater system customers as well as sewer system participants uh, that are smaller scale um, municipalities in different um, and were handled differently. So when we were inspected by EPA, we knew there were, there were three potential uh, approaches that EPA could take to, uh, for compliance. The first approach would be a letter, and the letter basically requires self-guided implementation, continued participation in a regional approach, and then a comprehensive, comprehensive CMOM implementation would be expected. The administrative order, a little bit more severe, uh, is enforcement that's administered by EPA Region 6. It's generally a short document that's tailored to the specific situation. Uh, it's an individual agreement between the city and the uh, EPA Region 6. A CMOM program would still be required in collaboration with the region. And then the third item 
which was what we were very concerned about trying to avoid would be a consent decree. And the consent decrees are enforcement that are negotiated with EPA and the Department of Justice in D.C. So different there from what the administrative order is, which stays more on a regional level. Usually long and they're very detailed. It can be very, very expensive, and usually there's little flexibility built into those, to those decrees. This is a map, and this is something that uh, Mary had mentioned as well about historically some of the consent decrees that we've seen. Um, the, in uh, red are where consent decrees or, or negotiations are ongoing, and blue is where they've been implemented. And you can see some of the large numbers uh, that have been uh, agreed to with uh, San Antonio at $2.6 San Antonio $2 billion, Seattle at $2.2 billion. I know Tyler was recently um, had a consent decree there as well locally. So this is definitely what we wanted to avoid. So this next graph or uh, table shows the average monthly cost of water and wastewater services. This was uh, created by the circle of blue. And so things you can stick out on this graph, you can see the Dallas-Fort Worth area we're in the 110 to 111 dollars per month as an average monthly cost for water and wastewater, uh, but some of them stick out to us like Atlanta at 326 dollars, Seattle at 310 dollars. You may not be able to read it, but that box in the upper left-hand corner says that Seattle and Atlanta have the highest monthly or total monthly bills. Each is building costly underground storage facilities and treatment plants to comply with the federal requirements to reduce raw sewage that is dumped into lakes and rivers. So this is documenting that their high rates are kind of directly been affected by uh, some of the consent decrees that they have had to, uh, to administer in their communities. So after our inspections by EPA, we really worked to develop an understanding of what EPA's concerns were. And they were these as follows, the lack of regional coordination and specifically uh, addressing capacity management jointly for our regional system. EPA desired comprehensive CMOM implementation that was tailored to prevent SSOs by the district and the communities. And there was a need for ongoing system maintenance, which included condition inspections, cleanings, and rehabilitation. On the bottom right, you can see a depiction of the percent ownership of the conveyance system assets. So what this graph is showing is that 95% of the pipes in the whole uh, regional area are owned by the communities where the district only owns 5% of those systems. The manholes, the district, 3%, and the communities, 97%. And then on list stations, uh, the district, 17%, and the communities, 83%. So if we were going to get a handle on all these issues, it was going to take buy-in by everybody to really uh, address it. So after we had a better understanding of EPA's concerns, then we established regional collaboration to respond to those concerns. So the first thing we did is we established a regional collaboration mechanism. We started having monthly uh, wastewater partnering meetings, and we developed a wastewater work group of each of our member cities that met on a monthly basis. We developed corrective action plans for each of our systems. And one thing that's a little bit different than maybe some uh, approaches are, is we shared these plans with the EPA. We tried to promote a very transparent approach to our corrective action plans. And then we met regularly with the EPA. Both North Texas and our member cities were meeting. We tried to be sure that we had each member city attend one of these update meetings to communicate with the EPA about what we were doing. And at those meetings, we listened very closely to what the EPA was saying. 
to be able to under, better understand that if we were in the right, going on the right track, that we were meeting their expectations. And then we formalized our commitment to a regional solution uh, through a memorandum of understanding. So this regional collaboration included a lot of different components, and these are just some of the components of that regional collaboration. Like I said, we created a memorandum of understanding that was executed by all the parties, and it committed, it demonstrated our commitment to each other and to the EPA. We worked together to develop a model regional CMOM program. We focused on the regional wastewater system members. Like I said, there's some other participants and things like that, but this was focused on our regional wastewater system members. We provided a forum to work regionally to establish desired outcomes of enforcement action. And then this model program establishes consistency with the understanding that all parties will have a unique implementation. So our regional collaboration avoided consent decrees, but it did require CMOM. And so six of the 13 communities uh, received letters from EPA uh, requiring continued participation in our regional approach. And CMOM plan development and implementation was expected to align with EPA requirements. So that was what the letters basically said, is continue doing what you're doing by participating in this regional collaboration and continue with development of a regional CMOM program. Seven of the communities received administrative orders, and those were uh, administered by the local Region 6 office. Uh, those also required participation in the regional uh, CMOM and required each of the individual communities to develop uh, CMOM plans within a 12-month period. So these letters were all issued around December of 2015, just in time for a nice Christmas present. And we were given 12 months to provide um, implementation of those plans. Well, I guess development of the plans and implementation would follow. And then like we mentioned, the consent decree uh, was avoided. So I've mentioned community CMOM plans and then a regional CMOM plan. So the, the, each of the communities developed their own plans, and the, the district completed a plan. And so we had 13 individual CMOM plans, and then one regional CMOM plan that basically defined the linkages between the district and the communities. It, it talked about reporting and monitoring and training and things like that that could be uh, worked out and uh, coordinated between the district and the communities. So the AOs, the administrative orders, <laughs> had two requirements. One of those requirements was that within 120 days, each community would provide a outline of their CMOM plans. And so the district and our wastewater work group met together and together developed an outline that could be provided to EPA and that was provided in February of 2016 to meet that 120-day submittal requirement that some of the communities had. We also thought this, uh, we felt like the outline would be very important to try to keep each of the, um, each of the CMOM plans to be very similar so that they could be uh, worked out together. And the model, we also provided a model CMOM which was basically the outline, but it included a narrative that explained the components that would be recommended for each of the different sections. And that was also provided in early February of 2016. And then at the end of the year, uh, within 360 days, the administrative orders required that each of those communities submit a CMOM plan uh, to EPA. And each of those were unique, but they did share a common outlines and organization for those. And while all the communities were not under administrative orders to provide their CMOM plans, uh, all the communities committed to developing CMOM plans along that same time frame. 
Another activity that we coordinated uh, with the communities in our wastewater work groups were developing CMOM objectives. And so these are the objectives, I won't read them all, but uh, the first one there addresses areas of excessive I&I &I in the wastewater system. The second one is to develop and maintain adequate capacity. The third one, to maintain the wastewater collection system to increase reliability and to extend service life. The fourth one, to develop and implement standard operating procedures and train the staff. Another one of EPA's concerns would dealt with record maintenance. So we had a, a objective to maintain records of the work performed to measure our CMOM performance. We had a concern to be sure that all of the cities were and the communities in the district were providing adequate funding for operation and maintenance of their collection systems. And then the last one there was to provide public education about how their activities can impact the wastewater collection system. Now the regional CMOM, like we said, it kind of documented the linkages between North Texas and the communities, it provided some background and historical information. It talked about how the budgets would be coordinated of the district and how those are communicated uh, with the communities, provided other communication and reporting guidelines. Another critical thing we did as part of development of this regional CMOM was we developed some critical standard operating procedures and we included those as attachments to our CMOM plans. One of those is a request for wastewater connections and point of entry protocol. We had procedures, but they weren't really well documented, so we uh, came up with this protocol. And then we needed to create a regional hydraulic model of the system, and so we came to some agreement on how that would be completed. And then improving communication whenever there is a flow diversion or an outage in one system that could affect another system, we documented some notification procedures for how we would communicate with each other uh, during those type of events. So this is a section I want to talk a little bit about our, our current, our initial implementation of our initiatives. So our written CMOB plan was completed in December of 2016. And one of our first initial implementation activities was to conduct list station condition assessments. And those were done to establish uh, baseline conditions, to establish preventative maintenance schedules, identify any urgent needs that we had in our list stations, and to develop some list station specific O&M manuals. So not just generic cookie cutter O&M manuals, but some that really got into the, the nuts and bolts of how we operate and maintain that specific station, how valves operations can affect that specific station, things like that. Another initiative we had was to do pipeline condition assessments. And this was conducted very similar to the one that uh, that Fort Worth that Mary mentioned and their, and their system where they were looking using laser uh, to get a look at the top of the pipe, sonar to look at the sediment level in the pipe, and then uh, CCTV as well. And this was to try to establish a baseline condition for our pipelines to have a better understanding of the condition they're in today, to identify any rehabilitation needs, and then also to identify cleaning needs. Uh, we don't we, we don't plan to just clean on a regular basis because it's on a schedule. We intend to clean based on our inspections, and so cleaning as needed based on what we find as we do our inspections. Asset management is an area where the district has been striving to grow recently. Uh, we've just recently implemented Maximo Spatial, uh, which provides more of a map visual background to the Maximo uh, system. And we're also uh, automating our overflow emergency response plan in Maximo so that our events can be logged and documented with that uh, software. Another one of our huge projects is to uh, initiate an expanded capacity assessment for the Upper East Fork interceptor system and the South Mesquite conveyance system. Those are our two 
largest systems, and we have expanded our capacity assessment. We have an existing uh, computer model of the Upper East Fork interceptor system, but it only includes North Texas assets, so it's only those large interceptors and didn't consider what was happening up in the community system. And so through all this um, endeavor, we've been able to uh, get some momentum towards being able to look and take a closer look inside the, uh, the community systems as well and extend our model up into their system where it can be affected, where one system may affect the other one, to have a better understanding of how they work together and not each isolated from each other. And this is going to be a three to four year endeavor. Um, right now we're developing and updating the model. And then in the next a few years later, we will be doing a capacity assessment assessment to evaluate our existing capacities. And then the third phase is capacity assurance where we evaluate alternatives to meet our level of service goals. And then we'll follow up after that with a uh, master planning cycle every five years. So definitely we can feel that through this process our collaborative regional approach has yielded positive results. Really aligning with our vision of regional service through unity meeting our region's needs today and tomorrow. This collaborative approach allows the local utilities to determine necessary investments that they need to provide safe, affordable, and reliable services, provides a framework to avoid future enforcement by implementing sustainable practices. And in January of 2017, so a month or so after uh, the communities had all developed their CMOM plans. We, we brought EPA in for a meeting and just a kind of a follow-up meeting at that point and we got some good feedback uh, from EPA. Uh, first I said they were very impressed with the coordination, communication, and commitment that has been demonstrated by the district and the cities. And then the third item I said that they felt like the systems were very close to being sustainable. But then they did leave us with um, the, the second bullet point there which says they, were, they did have some concern that each community will get the funding needed and that they'll be conducting follow-up inspections and they will write administrative orders where those would be needed. So Henry Ford said that coming together is a beginning, keeping together is progress, and working together is success. I can't go without acknowledging that each of the cities demonstrated a high level of cooperation. We had great cooperation among the cities, but not only the cities, but the regulators. The EPA was very um, supportive of our uh, approach that we took with the regional CMOM. And then we had also great support from uh, two consultants, uh, CH2M and Pipeline Analysis. And then also can't uh, close without two other acknowledgments. Uh, and those are two of the co-authors on this paper with me, and that's Jenna Covington, who is our Assistant Deputy Director for Wastewater, and she was basically the brainchild behind this transparent, collaborative approach with EPA. And then Ken Hall with CH2M, he was the project manager on this, and he led our group in all the communities through development of the regional CMOM plan. And then he also specifically worked on the district's uh, CMOM plan. And with that, I've got uh, be ready for questions. Thank you for that, Scott. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them into the chat box at this moment. We're, we're going to go ahead and answer your question. So while, while people are thinking, I do have one question already prompted here, and that is, <coughs> Does the SSOI initiative or SSO initiative protect us from EPA enforcement? And, and it does not. So if you look on the TCQ webpage here, it says that a participating system will not be subject to formal enforcement by TCQ for most continuing SSO violations as long as the overflows are addressed by the SSO plan. Note, participation in the TCEQ's SSO initiative does not preclude federal enforcement by the Environmental Protection Agency. So that's kind of a common question that we hear uh, about the SSOI program and how the TCEQ and EPA uh, jurisdictions overlap there. 
Okay, for Scott, how many, how much has the SSOI program cost the district and how much is the, cost, uh, and how much does it cost the cities? I uh, don't have the, the SSO, we don't have a specific budget for the SSOI program. Um, it's all part of our regional wastewater system and our uh, other conveyance systems budgets. It's kind of nestled all within there, so I don't really have a breakdown of the exact dollar amounts for that uh, particular particular item. But I know it has saved on enforcement actions by EP, EP by the TCEQ. Okay, so we have another question. We're going to let Mary answer this one. The question is, how do we join the SSOI if we do not have a WWTP permit as we do not treat wastewater, ours is then to TRA and TWU? I, I do not know the details on that. I would suggest you contact Region 4 of TCEQ. Uh, I'm sure they would be glad to work with you. Uh, on what it takes. I do know that our wholesale customers, when they report uh, SSOs, they include our permit number on their reports. Um, we ask that they copy us on those reports since it's under our permit number. Um, but I would suggest you contact uh, the TCQ region office here in Fort Worth uh, for assistance in doing that, and I'm sure they would be very glad to assist you. Okay, and another question for Mary. How much has Fort Worth SSO volumes decreased over the same time period as your graph? Oh, that's a good question. I actually don't have that data readily available to me to answer your question. I could see what we can tell. I can tell you, though, that some of the SSOs we're seeing are still some of the larger ones because it's on the larger lines. Um, but I would have to, um, I, I honestly don't have that data from our folks on the volume component to it. Um, but that's a good question and I'll see what I can do to get that data. Okay, so it looks like that's all the questions that we have. Thank you all again who joined us today and thank you to our speakers. Um, today's presentation and recording will be made available on our website, which is up on the screen. Um, thank you again to everyone. You have a great day. This webinar is now closed.